So yesterday we started talking about the definite integral, which was a way of computing areas under curves. Yeah. So today we're going to flush this out a little bit more. Talk about the definite integral. Okay. And let's stick with the uh, the easy picture. All right, we're going to stick with the single variable situation for a little bit. Let's redraw it and remember what was going on. So we started by fixing, I'm going to use a word here, which is overkill, let's say a region. Uh, the region from A to B, but it's, it's just an interval, right? It's just a line. But later on, we have regions. And then we have some function, which at least is defined on the interval A to B, or the region A to B. And we don't care what happens outside of it. And then we started drawing in rectangles, right, based on a partition. So we partitioned up this interval. Maybe we give names here. Uh, A was x0, B made it x5. Just made it nice and simple. And then we drew nice lines going up help put up side star rectangles. And then to give a roof to our rectangles, we had to choose points in the middle, which are called C0, C1, C2. And when I say middle, I don't mean they have to be in the middle. They could actually be on the end. Uh, we just choose somewhere in between the end points of each of these x's. Right? And whatever value the function takes on those points, right? Remember this was f of c0 and so forth. Right? That's how high we draw our rectangle. So for c1, that was how high we drew that rectangle. And okay, so this was f of c1, f of c2. Another nice rectangle, f of c3. There's f of c4. And so, well, our original goal was to calculate the area under this curve, but we decided this was, at least for now, too hard. So we're just going to calculate the area of these rectangles. And if you change these points, C1, 0 through C4, then right, the, the rectangles will change a little bit, and you'll get a different area. And if you change the partitions, of course, then you might have to change these Cs, all right, which would change the area. Or if you add more, right, more of these Xs, right, so you could refine the partition for them, okay, then the areas are going to change. Okay, but in any case, for any given configuration, you get an area. And the area right, said, well, for each of these rectangles, the area looked like, say, xi plus 1 minus xi, like x4 minus x3 or x2 minus x1. That's the width times the height, which is the function value at the point you choose in the middle. Times f of c, well, what does it match? Uh, the c should match the, the smaller index. So this is the area. Uh, well, let me get, I can give a name. This is rectangle 0, this is rectangle 1, rectangle 2, and so forth. So this is the area of rectangle i. Or, if I like, I'll give a name to this area of rectangle. And so, what we started wanting to consider was, well, I don't just want the area of one rectangle, I want the area of all the rectangles. So I'm going to do, you know, everybody remember this symbol here, the summation symbol, symbol, right, the Greek letter sigma. We add up the area of all the rectangles as i, well in this case, i starts at zero, and it goes to four. This is our, our shorthand. 
and we know that this is equal to well, the same summation, only we can replace A of Ri with the formula. Xi plus 1 minus Xi times F plus Ci. And yesterday we started calling this difference delta Xi to try to save space. However you want to write it. Okay. Now, we saw yesterday that a way of making this approximation better would be to choose more rectangles. Right? They would get slimmer. You choose more points, and, and so you'd end up, right, like for instance, if I, well, let's say I cut this first one in half. I drop my C0, and I'm just going to cut the interval in half. Okay. So now I need to choose a different C. I'm going to call this C0 and C0 prime. I know you can't see that anymore. And I can go up. Right. <coughs> and now I'm going to get, let's see, this one should now be, I'm going to get two rectangles where I had one before. And I should have a better approximation of the area under the curve by doing that. I can imagine a situation where you actually get it worse by choosing the C0, C0 prime particularly bad. But right, you can imagine over time as you just kept refining it, right, putting more and more partitions, your area is going to get closer and closer to the area under this curve. So in general, instead of looking at it with just you know, 0 to 4, we can look at it from 0 to n, as n is any number, right? Just grows and grows and grows. And it's always the same thing, right? We just add up the area of all the rectangles. Okay? So, being that this is calculus, what do you think we want to do to this end? We want it to go to infinity. Yeah, all right. If we stop at any finite you know, point, right? Then we'd say, okay, we'd have a nice approximation. Okay? We're not going to get the exact area with a nice approximation. But if n could go to infinity somehow, then, oh, maybe we, we, that's exactly what we need. Here's the problem. Infinity's not a number. Right? You can't just say, well, let there be an infinite number of rectangles. And this is exactly the same problem that we had when we did derivatives. Right? You divided by some number, a little h, and h was supposed to be going to zero, but you couldn't divide by zero, right? So the way we handled that problem was by inventing this notion of a limit. And we're going to try the same thing here. We're going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so we're not letting n be equal to infinity, we're just looking at the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay? And you remember what intuitively the limit was supposed to mean. A limit, which you remember for starters, it doesn't have to exist, right? A limit did exist, though, if it approached a value. Okay, not only does it have to approach it, it has to get close to it. How close to it? Arbitrarily close, right? Infinitely close. It has to get as close as you could. Any any degree of closeness you want to get, it has to be able to get there. Okay, but it doesn't have to just get close. Has to stay close. Yeah. Okay. This was this was the key. Okay. So this limit will exist if it will get close to some number and it stays close to some number. Okay. That's the intuition. And we can write this, of course, over here also using this one. So let me write it: delta x i times f of ci, right? And of course, you have to choose every time you refine it. You Rechoose your CIs. Now, of course, as this n is going to infinity, what has to be happening to these delta XIs? Remember, these are the widths of the rectangles. They, they have to get smaller. <coughs> so let's just add in here what we know is actually happening. Is that the width of these things is going to zero. Okay. This is a little imprecise, but it's, let's just think intuitively. OK, 
Okay. So, uh, these numbers are just some just nice finite numbers, right? Or whatever the function value is. You don't worry about those things too much. These things are going to zero. So what happens when you take just some nice finite number and multiply it by something going to zero? What happens to this whole term? It gets smaller and smaller, right? It goes to zero. Okay, so I'm adding up a bunch of zeros. That doesn't sound like a good way to build an area, right? You're adding up a bunch of nothing? Okay, but here's the thing. We don't just have a bunch of nothing. We got a whole lot of nothing. Right? How many nothings are we adding up? Well, somehow infinitely many nothings. And so what the moral is that if you take an infinite number of infinitesimally small things, you can actually get something finite. Yeah? Which is kind of bizarre. So you're adding up an infinite number of these things, and they're all really, really tiny. If they were all really, really big, there'd be no question. It would just explode, go to infinity. If they were all really zero, there'd be no question it would be zero. But this doesn't actually become zero. It's just the limit is as it approaches zero. Okay, so, so if you believe that our construction will actually give us the area under this curve, then, okay, we have this nice thing, we're going to give it a name. Okay, If you don't believe it, then there's no point in giving it a name. Okay, but if you believe it, we'll give it a name. I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to suggestively write the integral sign. There's no reason from anything I've done to think that you should use this symbol. Okay? No reason whatsoever. And at first, I want to write it in a slightly different way than it's normally written. Just to stay consistent with what I'm going to do later. I'm going to put the interval underneath the integral sign. Okay? So whatever region you're doing things over, you put it right under the integral sign. And this notation is what you're going to see later on when we look at double integrals. Now I'm going to put the function f of x and I'm going to multiply it by dx. Right? None of this should make any sense. By the way, of course, those of you who've seen this stuff before know that the typical way to write this is to put is something called the limits of integration, not to be confused with that limit, right? is to put the a on the bottom and the b on the top, and then everything else. What we want to do is justify this notation. That's going to be our immediate goal. Okay, now, before I give you the justification, let's just explore what this means in a few different situations. So the first situation, what do I mean by this? If I go from A to A, what should I mean? Zero. That <laughs> should mean zero, right? This is another fancy way of writing down zero. All right, this should mean compute the area of the rectangle with width zero and height f of A. <laughs> okay, well, that's got to be zero. So. This is really, think of this as a definition. <coughs> when we did over things over here, we're, we're somehow implicitly assuming A is less than B. So here we don't know what to do. Second, what if I, so here A, I'm really assuming is less than B. What if I write the integral, the interval backwards? Right, well, this doesn't, I mean, this doesn't even mean anything, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> This, this has absolutely no meaning. Okay. But we can, we can assign it a meaning. Okay, what's the, what is the meaning we're going to assign to it? Well, if I'm adding up, when I normally compute my area, I go from A to B. If I go backwards from B to A, the meaning I want to give to this is that you're getting somehow negative the negative of what you got. Now, of course, in terms of area, that doesn't mean anything, right? You can't have a negative area. 
but we're just going to define it. Like we're going to define it as the negative. of integrating over the region A, B. Again, yeah, this, these two are just definitions. The bottom one more so. Okay, now, the third thing is, This does not have to describe area. <clears throat> In all the pictures that I've done, I mean, it's always the same sort of picture, right? You bound things by the x axis. And you draw this nice curve that's over here in the first quadrant. But I could, for instance, draw a picture that looks like this. And then bound my thing from, say, A to B. And now notice, OK, all my function, what's my function values? Well, over here, they're going to be positive function values, right? But down here, I'm going to get negative function values. And so much of it is negative, right, that if you actually computed this out, you're going to get a negative number. And of course, negative area doesn't, what does that mean? I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Not only that, right, if, I mean, you might just say, well, okay, you're getting this negative area, but maybe it's, you just take the absolute value and that will turn into the right area of the whole thing. However, those, that right there is going to give you positive numbers, and those are going to give you negative numbers. So there actually is going to be some cancellation. So you're not even getting the area of it. Right. You're getting, if you like, these two areas minus this area. Okay, so th this is this is giving you something completely different than area. It's just, it's just a number. So you could use this in a more general situation. We use area as a way to motivate this definition, but it's not. This is not limited to just computing area. Okay. The next thing. What functions can we do this to? That is, well, when is this going to make sense? When is it going to exist? Remember, it's a limit. You know? Limits can exist, and sometimes limits don't exist. So are there any conditions we can put on our function to guarantee that this limit exists? And I won't prove this, but the answer is, if f is continuous on a b, then the integral over the region a b does exist. You can uh, you can weaken this a little bit. It's not so hard, for instance, um, if you have a function which is not continuous, but it's piecewise continuous, so it's a piecewise defined function, right? You remember those things, they can, they can have little hops and they can jump around and do weird things, right? So it may not be continuous to the little endpoints of the pieces, but that will still be, we call this, uh, if a function, if this limit makes sense, then we call the function integrable. Right? It has an integral down that region, we call it integrable. And, uh, well, let me write that. So, if this integral exists, we call f. So, we we'll usually just say integrable in this class, but this is actually a special kind of integral. There's more than one kind of integral, uh, and this one is uh, invented by Bernard uh, Riemann. So we call it Riemann integrable on A B. But I'll usually just say integrable since um, 
the Riemann integral is the only integral we'll, we'll use in this class. But if you go further on in mathematics, you will eventually see a better integral uh, called the Lebesgue integral. And you might be asking, well, geez, why do you give us the crappy one? <laughs> and, and the answer is, well, it, it's a little bit easier to define. And when I say a little bit, I mean a lot. Uh, the other one requires you to learn some stuff called measure theory, which is very, very nice. Uh, and maybe I'll just say a little bit about it. So that I can give you an example, I won't even I won't even prove this. I'll just give you an example of a function which is not integrable. And this is actually an example we've seen before, uh, last term. So that's an f. So I'm going to define a function which is going to be uh, very strange always either 1 or 0. And it's going to be 1 if x is a rational number. And it's going to be 0 if x is not a rational number. Yeah, he lays nodding his head, so you, you remember this one? Right. What's that? Uh, this, is, this was a really nice, yeah. Practical example. Practical example? Will you find a situation like that in your life? Ooh, real life is such a, uh, a poorly defined notion. Yeah, uh, so there are certainly going to be functions that arise quite naturally that you have a little trouble finding the Riemann integral of. This can happen. Uh, in mathematics, they're all over the place. You know, there's in some sense, more functions that you can't <laughs> do it to them than you can. Uh, but this is a very easy one to write down. Uh, and it's kind of fun because, uh, well, if you remember last, last term, we, we tried to graph this. All right? Think about what the graph will look like. Yeah, you remember what happens, right? Is, well, let me. I, I want to get rid of a line here. Normally we write the x-axis, but I don't want to confuse the issue too much. So I'll dot the x-axis. It's kind of hidden here. All right, so I'm going to put one up here. So at all the, the rational points, you, you get a, a point at one, right? But between any two rational points, of course, there's another rational point. Just take the average, right? And then you can just keep doing that. They look. I mean, you can't tell the difference, right? So it looks like a line. Well, kind of a curved line. On the other hand, all the irrational numbers, those are as densely packed or more so than the rational, right? So you also seem to get a line down on the x-axis. Now, if you use the vertical line test, right, and you draw a line down, it looks like it's hitting it twice, which would mean it's not even a function. But of course, it can't be hitting it twice. Hitting it twice would mean you actually had a point which was both rational and irrational. Which can't happen. So there's actually gaps in this line that you can't see, and there's gaps in this line that you can't see. So, but it, so because it, it's moving up really fast. What's that? My phone is on like loud, so I turned it on silent. Okay, very good. Sorry. So here's my question. Let's say I go, I mean, this is a, a you know, if you go over all real numbers, this is pretty bad. So let me just go from 0 to 1. Maybe I'll make it a scale. 1. Okay. What's the area under here? What's your intuitive answer? One, duh, of course. Okay. So certainly this limit should exist. <coughs> certainly if you, you integrate this function right, from 0 to 1, you should get 1, yeah? Okay. Turns out if you actually try to compute this limit, 
you can, remember when you do this limit, what you have to do, you have to partition your interval, and then you have to choose little points within those partitions, right? Those are your C's. No matter how you partition your interval, I can find uh, a better partition that, and then choose my C's very carefully so that I can make the, the sum here come out to be zero. Think how would I make things into zeros? I just choose my C so that they were always or irrational numbers, yeah? Or I could make it you know, as big as I want just by choosing all my C's to be rational numbers. So it's going to turn out that no matter how you partition it, as n goes to infinity and these things get really, really small, it doesn't matter. I can always, you can get it close to zero, you can get it close to one, but it can't stay close to zero or close to one. I can make it hop back and forth. And if you remember last uh, term when we looked at infinite series, we, we looked at uh, things like this. All right, one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one. All right, and this just keeps on going. All right, and we saw it just kind of if you take it term by term, it was one zero one zero one zero, kind of hops back and forth. Okay, and you can rearrange things and make it whatever you want it to be. Okay, so the same thing can happen here. You can't actually compute the Riemann integral. So, so this is this is this is bad. Uh, but the nice thing is that uh, we're going to be sticking with functions which are continuous for the most part, or at least piecewise continuous. So everything will be Riemann integrable. Uh, however, if you go on in mathematics, then you will learn this Lebesgue integral. And the Lebesgue integral is defined for this region. And it does turn out to be uh, zero. But if you swapped the zero and the one here, then it would turn out to be one. Yeah. And the reason why is because it turns out uh, there are not that many rational numbers, at least compared to irrational numbers. There are a lot more irrationals than rationals. And those of you in the honors class will see that uh, tomorrow. We'll talk about that. OK. Uh, so now we get to. The, the fun part here. Uh, let me give you one more remark here, which will lead right into the fundamental theorem of calculus, which sounds impressive. And it is. So the last remark I think I'll need here is the following. Let's say I integrate my function. over the region A, B. And from now on, all my functions are continuous. So I, I'm not worrying about any problems of integrability. Sounds like a word. Now let's say I choose some number C, let's say in between A and B. It could actually be one of the endpoints, but uh, I don't want to deal with kind of the trivial cases. Okay, so I just choose somewhere in the middle. So if we drew a picture, okay, I'm computing the area under here, and I draw, I pick some C somewhere in between A and B. And what I claim, and feel free to argue if you want is that the area under the curve, right, the whole thing, is the same as the area under the left side plus the area under the right side. Any disagreements to that? The area, the, the whole is the sum of its parts. Now, like some people are nodding their head immediately, yeah, absolutely, and then Jenna looks like she's really trying to find the loophole. Like it. Okay, if you, if you take a pie and you cut it in half, you 
you still have as much pi as you started with. And you don't have any more pi than you started with. That's all I'm saying here. You draw this area, you cut it in half, add up these two areas, and you get the original area that you started with. You, no question, right? Yeah, you think I'm trying to trick you, huh? You don't want to say something silly. Ah, clearly, you cut a pie in half. Okay, now, in reality, if you cut a pie in half, what happens? You leave a little bit of residue on the knife, you know? And then, then you know, you have to stop your three-year-old from licking it. <laughs> no, no, that's a knife, you know? Okay, but, okay, in mathematics, the nice thing is we can, we can cut without getting any residue left on our knife. The amount of area that you lose on this line is nothing, right? Because it's width zero, it's a point. So we're not worried about that. So that means that we can rewrite this integral to actually a sum of two different integrals. No, nothing tricky going on there. I'm not trying to, to fool you. It is what it is. It is what it is, and it's all that it is. Okay, so we'll, we'll need that in the following proof. So you'll notice I haven't been proving a lot of things this semester. And, well, part of that is there's not a lot of actually required much proof. And part of it is that most of the proofs are hard, harder than you guys want to see, uh, at least at this level. Uh, but I feel obligated to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, so this gets the title of theorem. It definitely deserves it. So let f of x be a continuous function, right? We want to assure integrability. Continuous. Actually, let me drop the of x. I don't. There's going to be some confusion with variables in here, so I don't want to confuse you with that. So just let it be a continuous function on an interval a. Now, because it's a continuous function, we know that it is integrable. Okay. Now, let's say I choose some point in the middle, like C, and I just look at the interval A to C. I just, just look at this stuff. Is the function still continuous on the interval A to C? Given that it's continuous everywhere on A to B. Yeah. Of course, right? <coughs> called a fortiori, from the stronger argument. Okay, so it was continuous everywhere here, A and B, then it's certainly continuous on the smaller interval. So we could just consider this area. Okay, now imagine, uh, in class, anybody ever have a teacher used an overhead projector? Right? And they, they put the paper on the overhead projector uh, over the transparency, so you can't see everything, right? And then they just kind of slide it down to a little bit more, a little bit more, so forth. Think of the same thing happening here. Okay. I cover up some portion of the curve. Okay. I just leave a little bit. So I start it at nothing. Okay, and then I just start revealing more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And at each step of the way, right, I get a new interval that I can look at, A to C, and I can compute the area that I'm left with. And I get a number, whatever that area is. So and it's completely dependent on what, what C I choose. Right? If I change my C, then this area changes, right? If I reveal more, then the area changes. So I'm going to use that to define a new function. I'm going to define a function. I'm going to call it big G. It's a G thing. I'm 
call a function of x, and what is it going to do for x? Well, my x is replacing my c. c is usually not a variable, so that's why I changed to an x here. So this, I'm exactly going to, using this, this g of x is just going to compute the area between a and x, or if you like, a and c. Now let me, because I'm using an x here, I don't want to use an x here, because it's not the, the same x. So let me just change the name of the variable. We'll call it t. Okay, but I, I haven't done anything to, to try to be tricky or anything, just to changing the, the name to protect the innocent family name. So all this function g of x does is measure how much area you have between a and b. So for instance, Right, let's just uh, do a quick example here. What is g of a? Zero. Well, it means you're going from a to a, and we know what happens when you go from a to a. Right, it's always just zero. That's our definition. What about g of b? Oh, yeah. So g of x is equal. It's, yeah, I mean, the f is this curve, right? And the g is the area under that curve. Yeah. So what is g of b? Well, g of b is all the area under the, the whole curve, right? At least from a to b. So, I mean, it just is the whole thing. And you can just put x in that if you want it. doesn't matter what you call the variable. It's still the same. Same thing. Okay. So this G, right, it just, just adds more area as you go. What's kind of ironic here is this. Let's say I, I just move it over a little bit to the next point. So I've just added one straight line. Have you added any area at all? It's just a straight line, no. Of course, I said something there that's kind of silly. Move over to the next point. What's the next real number after a real number? Right. What's the next number after zero? Zero point zero 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 one? How many zeros before the one? The bar over the first zero. <laughs> bar, well, that means you go to zero, right? No, <laughs> if you have then a, one. Zero, zero point, point. That, that means you go forever, one, right? And then one. Then how can you put a one at the end? <laughs> that goes forever. <laughs> Where does the one come? <laughs> this doesn't. Yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> if it if it if it makes sense, yeah. That's right. If you start with a false premise. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So that's all this G is. It's counting up area. Okay. Now. You have a new function, <coughs> g of x. What might you want to do with a function? Well, this is calculus class, and last term, what did I say you wanted to do every time you found a function? Derivative. Derivative. Okay, let's find the derivative. So I want to take the derivative of g, and I claim get back the original function f. So this, this is really surprising, right? You integrate a function, right? So you're just computing this area, then you differentiate, and you get back the original function. What this means is that we've now found a connection between differentiation okay, and this area problem. On the other hand, what does this tell you? This tells you that what is g? g if g prime is f, then what is g to f? g is an, an it's an antiderivative, right? It's an integral. Yeah? What is g prime in terms of like area? What is g prime in terms of well, okay, I mean, what is g primes in terms of area? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, so g prime, g is a function. Okay, it happens to give you area, but uh, 
I mean, then g prime is somehow the change in area with respect to time, if you like. Okay. So that's I mean, derivative is always giving you the rate of change. So it's the rate of change of area. All right. So, so we now know that area is connected to the derivative. Right. On the other hand, this is telling you you have an antiderivative. So in fact, the antiderivative is helping you to find area. Okay. And we're going to write down a different version of the fundamental theorem after we prove this one that makes that explicit. And it's a version that you, you're probably used to seeing. OK, but well we have to prove this first. And the proof is not that hard, but it gets to use a lot of our old friends from last term. Okay, so how are we going to prove this? Well, we need to take a derivative. So to take a derivative, we need to remember the definition of a derivative. Okay, so let's see. What was the definition of a derivative? It's the rate of change. I mean, I really want the, the real, the exact definition. What's the exact definition? Right? If f of x is a function, I say f of x is differentiable. Okay, what's the derivative of f? Limit to this. Limit. X to h. H goes to zero. Or zero. Uh, f x plus x. Huh? Minus f of x minus. Yep. Over x. Over h. Over h. Oh, h. Over h. <laughs> this was always the problem, right? Is h? If h was zero, this wouldn't be defined. But we just take the limit. So h is never actually equal to zero. It just gets arbitrarily small. Right? And then we saw, ah, actually, this was somehow useful. It's opened up a whole new world to us. OK. So we need to compute this, only instead of f, we need to have g. OK. So we need to look at things like g of x plus h. Okay. What is g of x plus h? We'll see. By definition, you go from a to x plus h. Now, I actually have to be a little careful here. When I say h goes to 0, there's actually two ways it can go to 0. Right? It can go from the positive side or the negative side. And you have to get the same thing. Well, let me start with the positive side. So let me, for right now, I'm just going to assume that h is greater than 0. And then later on, I'm going to just argue that when h is less than 0, basically the same argument works. So let's stick with x, h greater than 0. So then this becomes a to x plus h. Now, if we don't, if x is, uh, that is, if h is too big, uh, then this isn't going to make any sense because you'll be outside B. Right? You can't go too far. But remember, H is eventually going to get go to zero. So we can assume it's already a small enough. Okay, and then this should be F of T dt. And G of X, well, that's just what it is. Definition. Okay. And then I'm going to have to subtract them. That's what this, the next thing I'm going to have to do is subtract. Okay, so let me subtract it. I get e of x plus h minus g of x. And this is going to equal the integral over a x plus h minus the integral over a to x. <clears throat> okay, now let's think what's going on there. When I go from a all the way to x plus h, I get all that area, and then I subtract the area which is coming from a to x. So what am I left with? 
this. Yeah, the stuff from from where to where. From the beginning to what am I left with? Yeah. Can I draw a picture? Let's take the one we have. Okay, let's call that X. And this will be X plus H. So, the first integral, we compute all of this area. Everything from A to X plus H. In the second integral, we just go from A to X and we subtract. So we start with all this and we subtract this. What are we left with? We're left with this piece. That's the only stuff that doesn't get subtracted out. You still don't seem convinced. Like, where's zero? Like, does that even relate to Zero? Well, zero is over here. Wait. Okay, so H is getting smaller. Yeah, so as H gets smaller, right, this line just gets closer to this one. Okay, so we're left with the area from X to X plus H. Okay, cool. So this difference on top is actually just this rectangle. Right. Well, not quite a rectangle because there's a little curve at the top. Okay. So can we make a rectangle? Because we're not good with curves still. We don't know what to do with those yet. Well, what if we wanted to put a lower bound on the area of this rectangle? How could we do that? Wait, what do you mean by a lower bound? Let me draw another picture to go with this. Let's say I have a rectangle. Except it's not really a rectangle because <coughs> does something like that. Okay, now this this region has a certain area, there's no doubt about it. Alright? And if I told you the area was zero, you'd say, well, that, that's that's a little lower than the area, I think. And then, alright, let's say I went up here and said, okay, well that's already area one. And you'd say, yeah, but you're still missing something. So you haven't, it's definitely less than the area. Okay. And so I keep going up and I keep giving you these numbers. And these are all what I would call lower bounds. Okay. These are numbers which are, you know for sure that the area is above that number. So is there a nice easy way to make a lower bound on this that is a good lower bound, right? It's, it's as big as we can think all right, without having to work too hard. So what's f? I mean, what's my x, right? So I can start here, and let me let me make this picture a little more dramatic. Where should I draw the top of my rectangle to get a good lower bound? Bottom of the curve. Yeah, bottom of this curve, right? If I draw a rectangle here then, yeah, I, I, I'm certainly missing things, okay? But without, you know, starting to draw a little funny shapes in here, okay, there's no easy way to get a, a better lower bound, okay, with, a, with just a rectangle. Okay. So this point here is a really good one. Now, what if I wanted an upper bound? Yeah, I just choose the top, okay, the highest point. And that would give me a maximum. I'm getting way too much, right? All this extra area up here I'm getting. Okay, but it's, it's certainly a good max upper bound. I mean, an upper bound, uh, it's certainly an upper bound, and it's without having to you know, do anything complicated, it's the best one I can get. Okay. Now, how do I know that a minimum and a maximum, though, always exist on an interval? Right? If I have some interval, just to forget about area. I have some function on an interval. Okay? I choose two points on it, right? A and B, and, and I'm allowed to include the endpoints. 
how do I know that this function, assuming it's a continuous function set, between A and B has a minimum value and a maximum value? I mean, where would you get such extreme points? Value theorem. Ah, the extreme value theorem, right? The extreme value theorem told us if you have a closed interval, right, so you get the endpoints, and you have a continuous function on that closed interval, then you are guaranteed to find a minimum and a maximum. Start with the minimum too high. A minimum and a maximum. <laughs> yeah. So, what if it was a straight line? Well, then you, I mean, then every point is both a minimum and a maximum, right? So. We don't necessarily have to have distinct minimums and maximums. <coughs> this, is, this is a very nice situation. It's a straight line. That's very cool. Uh, then it's not a function, right? Because it definitely fails the vertical line test. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah? So, what's the theorem that um, tells you if you have lots of minimums and maximums? That you have, oh, like local minimums, local minimums. <coughs> so, this is, this is a different one. So, you have, uh, well, you have the first, uh, uh, that you actually have them, this is by Fermat's theorem. Um, and this is telling you if you have a, well actually what that says is you have a minimum or a max and there's a critical point. Um, so what I, I'm forgetting what we call all these things last term, that's why I'm struggling with the main theorem. Yeah, so of course, uh, you're never, you're not guaranteed to have a min or a max, a relative min or a max, okay, on an interval. But, if you have a closed interval, you are guaranteed to have an absolute maximum and absolute min. So take for instance, well, take the same setup and just draw a line that looks like this. And then straight upper <coughs> moving line. I would hesitate to call this point a local minimum. Right? Only be it, maybe you can think about it as a one-sided local minimum, but I don't like it because it's not you know, defined over here. It might, might go down further. Uh, and the same thing over here. It's not a two-sided local minimum. But we do call this an absolute minimum and that an absolute maximum. And the extreme value theorem tells you you, you get those, those absolute min and absolute max. If this was not, if we, if we put parentheses here, right, we don't include the endpoints, then you wouldn't even be guaranteed those. So it, it can get really bad. Okay, so the point of all this is, by the extreme value theorem, you're going to get this lower rectangle. And by the extreme value theorem, you're going to get this upper rectangle. So let me call the, the area of this whole lower rectangle, so area of this lower rectangle, Equals, let me call it little m sub h. Remember, this rectangle is coming from here, right? The x, it's, it's this, it's coming from this picture, right? And it's dependent on what h you choose. As h gets smaller, right, this rectangle slims down. But of course, as it slims down, when you start drawing these rectangles, you're actually getting closer to the area. Okay, so that's good. And the area of right, the larger rectangle. Right, so that's the one that goes all the way to the top. Okay? I'll call that big M sub H. Yeah, little m and big M. And what we know, actually, Let me just make one modification to this. Let me actually let this be the height. Or, I'm sorry. I don't want to say this. How did I say this? Uh, yeah. So the height of that rectangle 
And so the area, well, remember, the, what's the width of this rectangle? Remember, this is it's coming from this picture. All right, what's the width? The width is h. Yeah. So the area is not mh. It's actually, well, h times mh. And of course, this big height is what I'm going to call big mh. And so the height of the big rectangle is big mh times h. Okay. This h? No, uh, this is mh. This is big mh, that's little mh. So little mh is the height of this minimum rectangle, and big mh is the height of this maximum rectangle. Now here's the here's the payoff of all this. I know that the area of the minimum rectangle is less than the area under the curve. Yeah. So little m h times h. Right? Well, okay, in especially in silly situations like Chris's situation, we have a straight line. They could be equal. On the other hand, I know that the maximum rectangle is bigger than this area, or possibly. <coughs> All right, now, <coughs> remember, this middle term came from where? Uh, it came from this difference. Those, those are equal. So I've now bounded this bit by m little h times h times m big m little h times h. Oh, okay, then. You're giving me that sour plus again. What's going on? Okay, the these inequalities. Yeah. Okay, so we have a we had this area under a curve and came from this one right here. We drew a rectangle that we knew was not as much area. It was a lower bound. And then we drew another one which we knew was bigger than it. And the area of the bigger one we wrote as m little h times h. And the area of the smaller one we wrote as m little h times h. Get the little letters, little h times h. Okay. And so then all I've said here is that the area of that under that curve, right? Just saying, I'm just uh, the area of this curve is bigger than this area that we designed to be smaller than it. And it's less than the area that we designed to be bigger than. That's all we're that's all we're getting at. Okay. Now let's go back and remember what in the world we were trying to do. We were trying to compute the derivative of g, which meant we had to look at g of x plus h minus g of x. That we've done. But then we have to divide it by h, which we haven't done. So let's divide everything by h, and look what's going to happen. All those, all those nice h's are going to go away. So m little h is less than or equal to uh, 1 over h times the integral x, x plus h, f of t dt is less than or equal to m sub h. So this in the middle is just this term divided by h. So what's left to do to get the derivative? Right. Uh, we have g of x plus h minus g of x. You just divide it by h. What's left? You have to take the limit. OK, so let's, let's do that. Uh, So the limit, as h goes to 0, of little m sub h is less than or equal to the limit as h goes to 0. I don't want to write all this out. Right? What do I get if I do the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h times this integral? Well, this integral, remember, is the same as this bit. So when you divide it by h, you're just getting the derivative of g. That was the whole point. So 
this is actually g prime. Okay, and that's what we've computed this whole time. And then this is less than or equal to the limit as h goes to zero of big n h. Now, as h goes to zero, right, this rectangle gets slimmer. And what's happening to the little m sub h and the little and the big m sub h? What are they going to going to get closer to? Each other. You get closer to each other, right? Why? Because as you get these slim, right, if you put it way over here, what's going to happen? The minimum value is now here on the end, and the max is, is not that far away. And as this keeps getting closer, right, the max is just going to go right on down, right on down. And what are they both going to approach? They're actually going to approach the function value at that point, right, at x. So this, right, this limit is actually f at the point x. This is g prime of x. So f of x becomes less than or equal to g prime of x less than or equal to f of x. So what do we conclude? They're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah. We're actually, we're, we're omitting something that we know, which is, okay, if a limit over here and a limit over here end up as they're the same limit, right, then by the squeeze theorem, right, you know they're all equal. Okay, that's what's really going on back here. But in the end, this is saying that F <coughs> is G prime, which is what we wanted to prove. business. Okay, but actually all we did was compute the derivative in the most naive way we could. We just plugged it right into the definition. Right? But we got to use the extreme value theorem, we got to use the squeeze theorem. Right? Lots of good stuff in the last term. Do you remember the demonstration of the squeeze theorem? Yeah, I remember. Were you, were you one of the... Yeah, I was the, I was the middle. You were the middle. Who was on the end? Was oh, were you? Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Was obeyed the other one? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. yeah, so you guys weren't around, of course, for the demonstration of the squeeze theorem. You watch the videos for this one. Okay, so, so this is already quite remarkable. We've connected the derivative and the integral and areas all in this nice, happy family. Uh, but next time, we're going to prove a different version of this theorem. Where I, which is going to say exactly how to compute these areas using an antiderivative. So it's going to be more explicit and it's going to be the form that we use. And you might be asking, well, geez, if that's the one we're going to use, why didn't we prove this? The answer is, well, to prove this other form, we're going to use this. So this will be very important in the proof. Yeah. But then we'll, then everything is going to be very easy after that. Because what I don't like to do is compute integrals. You know how to do that already. Be in good shape. Questions? Dina, you look like you have a question. Um, how did you go from the second to last time? From here to here? Actually, here to here. From there to there to there. From here to here to here. Okay, so first, you have to you have to actually think what do these limits become, right? What is the limit as h goes to zero? of this little mh. Well, in this picture, it's clear. As, as h goes to 0, right, the, the minimum point in this interval is always that left end. As soon as you leave, lose this one, right, you start going up. And right about there, the minimum is going to start becoming that point. Okay, So that mh is clear. That's what the point is going to be. And that's actually the function value at x. Right? This is x, this is x plus h. Okay, and that's the function value f of x. Now what's happening to the maximum? Well, it starts way up here, and as you move this line in, it goes down to here, and as soon as you get right up there, the max jumps over that point. Yeah, that's now the maximum of, of what you can see, right? If you go right here, right, this is now the maximum point on the curve. And as you move this in, it stays right at that point, stays right at that point, stays right at that point, but as soon as you get past that point, it starts moving down. Starts moving down, it starts moving right in toward 
with f of x. Right? So as h goes to 0, this big mh right, also goes down to this m of x, right? which means that these have the same limit. And by the squeeze theorem, then, they must all be equal. OK. Oh, one thing I didn't say. At the beginning, you know, we made this assumption that h is greater than 0. So there's a, there's a little bit of just uh, garbage work at the end where you have to go in and say, okay, now, how do my arguments change if h is less than zero? And the answer is going to be not a heck of a lot. It's just going to be the same thing. Right? Everything's going to work out fine. So you really do get, I mean, we've only computed one side limit here. We need to compute the other side limit. It all works out fine. There's, no, there's nothing complicated. Okay. 